Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second episode of our World Heritage Talks. I hope you have enjoyed the first edition of this talk. And if not, you can find a video on our YouTube channel. You will find a special playlist with a series of talks that we will be having and posting on a monthly basis. My name is Maria Eugenia Siguencia. Uh, and today I'm honored to have with me two guests who are an special part of this initiative. As in the first talk series and in accordance to the same principle of intergenerational exchange, I would like to welcome Maike Huthop and Francesco Vandarin. This time I have prepared some questions related to the performance of the initiative as how you as insiders perceive it. So let's get started. Um, the first question is if you can talk a bit about how did the initiative kick off the origins, is there some special story behind? And this goes to Francesco, one of our actual initiators. Uh, so please, uh, Francesco, the mic is all yours. Thank you very much, Maria. Well, this, let's say very simply that I think that we just um, knew that there was a need for uh, an area of discussion that uh, we can call civil society within the World Heritage Convention uh, system. And this was missing, you know, and since 10 years uh, with many friends uh, that like, I was inside the system and I was uh, at UNESCO until three years ago, but many others that were working and so on, we kept saying, you know, this is something missing because, you know, if it is too much closed into a, an inter strict intergovernmental process uh, and perhaps, uh, you know, in a close dialogue with the advisory body that it cannot belong to you know, what uh, uh, this very large constituency that now exists around the world, um, managers, uh, uh, academic researchers, just people that are interested in the uh, success of the World Heritage Convention. So we found that there was a missing leg in the, and as you know, a table doesn't stand on two legs. So we needed the third leg. <laughs> so we saw that as the third leg of the table. And uh, I think it will not help, but the COVID, say strange enough but that's true because we can find anybody at home so we started a year ago we started contacting friends and people and you know colleagues and so on and, and the circle became very, very large and then we said okay let's do something and, that, and it is how the it's very you know big and uh, you know boiling in it that we have today uh, in the making is uh, it came about uh, so i think it was essentially a response to a need uh, a need for something that is more transparent, more widespread and involving uh, different groups and different, and different um, constituencies, open to the youth, much more open to the youth than the convention is, uh, is today, and also in a way guarding the convention from certain issues we have uh, pointed to, like, for instance, uh, the issue of, uh, you know, too, too, too strict uh, discussion among member states, the exchange of uh, favors, uh, what we call politicization, which is essentially, you know, the fact that uh, not always science-based uh, uh, decisions are taken. That's in, in a nutshell. Yeah, thank you very much, Francesco. I think you've made a really good point, saying that uh, the, the pillars actually to to maintain and to keep it uh, running this initiative. Uh, so thank you very much for, you, for your answer. Uh, Maike, now from your perspective and perception, how did you find out about the initiative and how was the state of it at the moment you joined? Uh, Francesco has stated already that it started around a year ago. So please tell us your experience on this. So thank you, Maria. Thank you for organizing this also. Um, I joined the initiative half a year later. Uh, by that time, uh, the scoping of the 21 debate was already done. Um, the year was already uh, roughly planned out and it was just a matter of starting up. So by the time I joined, and I joined because a good friend of mine invited me, um, by the time I joined, um, uh, it was really a question of, uh, we need a website, we need to uh, facilitate this and these kind of things. So this is um, how I strongly became involved, um, yeah, to really uh, help on the practical side and to make everything happen. 
first big focus was the launch event and uh, at the moment we are very hard working on the 21 debates. What I like about the initiative is the searching character of the initiative. It really changes every two weeks. Um, aims are high. Uh, it's yeah, relatively uh, successful in the sense that there's a lot of interest, but this also um, yeah, it's a big challenge, of course. But as Francesco said already, uh, Corona is um, putting this initiative in a very special light, in the sense that by now there are so many people involved with this initiative, and we're on daily, uh, we are in touch on daily base through internet, uh, through emails, through WhatsApp, through every type of medium. Uh, it is buzzing that we haven't seen each other in real life. And it's actually quite special. And um, it is also what I like. Um, we don't have to travel. We don't have to print a, a carbon footprint. Personally, uh, I think that is really, um, yeah. And it creates us as an uh, institution of the future in that sense. Yeah. That's very true, the, Mikey. Thank you for, for your reflection. Uh, say that uh, now I would like to ask about yourselves and your interests and fields of expertise and how do you think that has that has contributed to the our World Heritage Initiative. So let's continue with Mike, if you don't mind, Mike. Mike. <laughs> Mike, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. Um, well, uh, I uh, am 33 years old uh, and I, uh, I graduated um, yeah, quite a few years ago, let's say, I think eight years ago or seven years ago. Uh, in that time, uh, at the time I um, ended up as, a, I started my career as a heritage, uh, cultural heritage consultant. And uh, it is very, very challenging as a young person to become a World Heritage Consultant because you need to know everything. First of all, you need to know to make a business. Second of all, you need to know your history. Third of all, you need to know your um, planning skills. You need to have your, um, your social skills. And yeah, you, you, really, you really need to be all round as a, as a, at once and you cannot fill in any of the areas. So the reactions that I got often was, okay, what is your expertise? But on what ground are you here? So that basically made my career very short um, and uh, really, really demanding, very stressful. So I decided to go out of uh, heritage and uh, to do a um, commercial job. And um, yeah, this tells me that um, there is a lot to improve in the world in the world heritage field, especially the business side. Um, and um, there is not really um, yeah, yeah. I see the, our world heritage also as an opportunity where young people get a voice, and this is amongst the many things I want to um, achieve through this initiative. This is one of the things that I would really. Um, like to address what it is as a young people to be in the heritage field in a generally closed uh, conservative field in a time that we have so many challenges for the next generations and I think there's really yeah um, space for this in uh, our world heritage. Yeah that's that's true um, thank you and I think that the um, a lot of the challenges that the new generations are facing with and this is uh, somehow obvious also in this initiative and how um, this is all inclusive and we are integrating the young generation. Thank you very much, uh, Maike. And um, what about you, Francesco? Most of us well, are uh, aware of all the effort <laughs> displayed for the preservation of cultural heritage from your side. So what do you think is your strongest capacity for, for this initiative? Well, as you know, first of all, I'm on the other side of the spectrum, age spectrum. <laughs> so, so I'm, you know, I had really, I think it was, was really was you know, the chance of my life. You know, I, you know, I was for almost 18 years uh, UNESCO in charge of the World Heritage Conventions as Secretariat. You know, and then and then after for 10 years, and then for eight years, you know, as part uh, as, as Assistant Director General for Culture, which is a even broader, you know, 
superintendents of cultural affairs of UNESCO. So I think in these 18 years, I've seen, I've seen them all. <laughs> and uh, I think also that I've tried a lot to uh, push for certain uh, reforms, uh, for initiatives that, that were you know, aimed to expand the, the reach of the convention, to innovate a little bit also on the on its, uh, uh, the way it's, uh, it's implemented and so on. Of course, it's never an individual venture. It's always very collective. You know, the convention is a very, very large body of uh, member states, the secretary, the advisory board, so nobody can claim to be the, uh, to have the solutions. But at the same time, I think when you're inside and you have, a, you know, the, the, the hands on the wheel, you know, I think you can steer <laughs> one or other direction. I think uh, that's what I try to do. And I think uh, perhaps, uh, I, I think that good in terms of uh, you know pushing this and uh, trying to to have more more uh, say impact in the world. Um, now, one thing that, as I mentioned earlier, one thing that was always missing was this third leg. You know? And uh, of course, when you are inside and you work for for as a secretary for member states, you know this appears like something accessory. You know something that you, of course, you, know, you work for the civil society. This is the purpose of, uh, of, a, of a UN organization. Even even states do not exist per se. They work for society. I hope at least. <laughs> um, but uh, but um, but in, in reality, you know, it's a very close. Thing. So and this is when you were uh, outside and when I left, uh, this became very clear. Um, I think that many of the issues that uh, we sort of see today that are a bit critical on the future of the convention depend from this uh, degree of closeness of the system. So uh, the idea of expanding it and creating a, you know, a possible third leg or some, some air, an area, a platform, say, to create, uh, to extend the discussion, I think it was, uh, was the right one. And we're very happy that our world heritage now is on the march. Of course, it's, it's just the beginning. We have we have started, uh, you know, very, very just a month ago, months and a half ago, <laughs> and so yeah, we cannot say uh, that is done. Uh, but I think we have a vision, and we have a trajectory, and we have really a lot of people with, with their enthusiasm, free and free contribution, work, and so on, uh, are making this thing into something quite, uh, quite remarkable. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Francesco. Um, it's quite. Uh, rich to to hear also as you said as an insider coming from a official um, institution to work on this uh, voluntary basis and this group of people that is uh, working for the world heritage preservation so um, now I move to the next uh, query and uh, that would be being such being part of such a diverse group of people. Now let's talk about the lights and shadows being behind the scenes of all world heritage. What have been the most challenges, challenging part of this experience? So Francesco, would you like to start with this question? Well, you know, launching an organization, an international organization is always very complicated because you need not only to create the network, but also keep people in the same direction. And you have people here in our, in our system. We have people from all over the world, all the regions, all the cultures, uh, all the ages. <laughs> so sometimes we, we have a, you know, a, a, an issue of somehow finding the proper common ground and, and direction. I think we, we have done it though in terms of, uh, you know, um, and probably it's still in the making, but I think we, we, we are agreed on a certain vision and we have agreed on a certain process that we are at the moment uh, implementing. Create, extend and create a network. And I think Micah knows something about because she's the one that maneuvers the, the machine. And so, and you know, I think as of today, we have what, 2,200 um, people that have uh, subscribed to our, to our system for our newsletters as well. This is a month and a half, it's not bad. Eh? I think it's quite good. Eh? Um, so network and then a policy framework or let's say a policy platform. I don't like the word platform, but that's what it is. It's essentially a policy package that we want to discuss a year from now when we uh, will be the 15th anniversary of the convention in a kind of a global uh, uh, 
uh, meeting uh, because next year will be very important to uh, to somehow stimulate the reflection on the future of the competition. 50 years is a good time for assess the results, the successes, the failures, etc. But it's also very important to look at the next 50 years, and we think that we can contribute uh, to this discussion with the, you know, the freshness of approaches and ideas that are from our members and, uh, and the fact that we are free to talk. We don't, we're not constrained by you know, obligations. We're not under contract by, on anybody, right? So we are free to talk, to think, to express our things. And we hope that uh, the other side will be, will be listening. But you know, in reality, what's important is that we create you know, the culture of, uh, of civil society and give a voice to civil society. This is the main purpose, we have a big voice, that represents a collective intention, which is, of course, in the same direction of uh, the others. We're not uh, against anybody, but we, have, we are for the, 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 the success of the convention for expanding its, its role and so on. But, you know, there are many, many challenges that are open and we need to discuss them. Yes, thank you. Mike, uh, has been your experience of the challenges different from the Francesco one? No. Uh, I think Francesco has very well uh, put it to words. Um, my personal uh, surprise in this initiative uh, is the Global Outreach Team. Uh, it's a, quite a relatively large group at the moment of young people um, that are collaborating to overcome the language barrier, which is a very big uh, challenge in our, 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 type of, um, our type of initiative. And especially if you want to reach local communities and um, civil society, like global civil society, our audience is literally every inhabitant of this world in a, in a way, we need to overcome these language barriers. And uh, so this is why the global uh, outreach team uh, came to life. And um, at the moment we have 30 channels in, in 12 languages. And uh, we try to um, create a consistent flow of uh, information uh, across these accounts and across these, um, all these languages. And we really try to uh, overcome this language barrier. Um, it's, it's difficult to achieve. Um, it's, it's really hard work um, to uh, maintain all these channels and to really um, uh, attract uh, to, to engage people, but uh, I really like the uh, spirit of the global outreach team. It's extremely efficient group and uh, yeah, it's, I'm really surprised by it. And this is really beautiful because I've just never seen something like this to cross so many language barriers at once. Yeah, thank you. This, I'm talking is, my personal, this is my personal, uh, yeah, what I really enjoy in this initiative specifically next to all the other things. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm talking about languages. Um, I'm, I'm just uh, thinking about the possibility also to, not, to open up this uh, discussions, this talks to other languages. So let's hope for, for this in the coming um, editions. Uh, so with these challenges uh, and all these conversations as we have, uh, I would like to finish um, asking you about the future. How do you perceive the sustainability of this initiative after the celebration of the 50 years of the convention in 2022? So just also with your final words, uh, let's listen to Maike. How do you envisage it? Um, well, as long as um our planet and our world heritage, or our world heritage on this planet. So the world heritage on this planet is not safeguarded. I think there is still work for this initiative. Um, it's often said that we're building the car while driving it. I don't know where it leads to. As I said, the initiative changes every, um, every two weeks. Um, but yeah, for me, um, I think uh, I think world heritage is uh, very um, interesting as a field because those are the treasures of our planet, let's say. And if we learn to protect these treasures, we can also protect the rest of the planet. So it's a really a place of good and bad practice. And this good and bad practice happens together with civil society. 
And um, I think uh, I see World Heritage really as a lab, or you put it under the microscope, let's say. Global problems are under the microscope, I mean. And um, yeah, I just would like to continue fighting in my life for this, and I hope that, uh, that our World Heritage will, yeah, be the vehicle, let's say, for this challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true. Thank you. And um, so let's uh, finish with Francesca about your perceptions. It's uh, somehow in line with the was what Mike Mike has said. Mike is the future. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, you asked about sustainability. Now let me let me say sustainability. Uh, it means that we are able to project our uh, action on long term, mid term, long term, a few years. And so. Now, at the moment, it, it, the organization is very new, right? And nobody believes that we have zero budget. We operate on zero budget. Uh, doesn't mean that you know the different partners are not spending money for the things. Of course, they are investing. But in terms of our central, you know, organization, we have zero budget. That's not that's not sustainable. So we will have to, uh, you know, build little by little. What we call it, secretariat, a group of people that you know are somehow supported. Otherwise, you know, they will not be able to, to do the work, uh, you know, that, that is needed. We can ask volunteer work uh, up to a certain point. You know, and we are completely aware that this is a transitory situation. So sustainability also refers to the to an organizational framework. We have put that in place. Operation. So I think from, from now to next year, when we will have the global meeting, we will have to go beyond through this, this passage. We will have to have fully operational secretariat supported by, don't we don't, I'm looking for millions of dollars, we're looking for small money that allow people to, to, to dedicate their, their time to, to this. So sustainability is a challenge for uh, 2022. So let's uh, discuss it again in a year and see whether we have <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. We will continue doing these talks and we hope that we can contribute also to the sustainability of this group. So thank you very much for this fruitful thank talk. You. It has been a journey through the story of this initiative together with your valuable contribution and experience. Thank you for sharing these ideas with us. And thank you to all subscribers of our newsletter. Stay tuned for the upcoming episodes of our World Heritage Talks. See you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, Maria. Bye. <laughs>